So speaking of Mr. Harpool, why don't I take this moment to introduce him? Um, so Mr. Adrian Harpool is the principal and chief strategist of Adrian Harpool Associates. Um, and that is a black owned Baltimore based strategic planning, marketing, branding, public relations and communications consultancy firm. And so he assists in planning and implementing broad and ambitious programs in support of large scale real estate development projects, political, political campaigns and public education awareness initiatives through media and grassroots, uh, grassroots networks. And so Mr. Harpool is really an expert in communications and really an expert in marketing. And so that's what we're going to be speaking about today during his presentation. And so I'm very excited for everyone to meet him because I do think he has a lot of great insights to share. All right, there you go. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to join you all this morning. Um, I was told we'd be doing a workshop, and I like to be, for these things, I think it's a two-way street. Um, there's an opportunity for me to learn as well as to share what information I've amassed. <clears throat> and so what's important to me always is to know who I'm talking with, and I won't say talking to, in this case, talking with. So if we could take a few minutes to get to know you, if you don't mind. Um, I've seen some names pop up. There are a couple spots where there are not names showing. But if each of you could take a minute or so to give me a, uh, just to, to introduce yourself and tell me what your enterprise is, if you will, um, that will help me look, you know, in terms of some of the things I might share in terms of being sure that it is um, on target and uh, relevant to your, your needs. So I've written down some of the names here that I saw on the screen. I'll start by just calling out those names and then once we've exhausted that list of the names that I've had, anyone who has not been mentioned, then please take a moment to introduce yourself. Um, Tiffany Page. Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, as you just stated, Tiffany Page. I am uh, an educator and I am also the co-founder of Virtual Village, uh, where we provide virtual learning support services to um, students, uh, school staff, family, and community at large. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Excellent. And I did see that now that I, uh, that she pulled that up, I saw that on the, on, on the uh, social media. Um, Derwin Whitmore? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm Derwin Whitmore. I'm a, uh, a veteran, a former federal law enforcement officer. I am a uh, financial services professional, and I'm also the chairman and CEO of Black Wall Street, Southern Nevada, where we're leading the economic empowerment movement for the African American community uh, via education, community outreach, and cooperative economics. Thank you. Uh, Natasha Anderson. Hello, I'm Natasha. I'm still trying to turn my camera on. I don't know if it's because I have bad service in my area, but it will not cut on. I'm with the Plantation Park Heights. I am the community outreach coordinator. Um, I'm also an urban farmer and I'm also a owner and I'm looking forward to elevating our farm into bigger things. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Nice. Uh, Damon? Yeah, Damon Tazia with the um, Kepper Institute, um, current fellow and um, board member. And one of the programs of the Kepper Institute is a creative cooperative um, in central Indiana called Creative Cafe. So um, looking for insights and ways to to kind of help grow that and build that um, within the community wealth building space for creative entrepreneurs. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Hello, Jeff Franklin here in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am a worker at one of the big hotels here in Las Vegas. I've had an interest in the last eight years of being able to work in a cooperative and I would like to be part of building a cooperative and that's why I'm here now finding out how to do all that. Thank okay. you. Uh, Khalil.
I think we can hear you now. Uh, your mute is on mute still. Okay. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning. Kyle Lim, Africa. I'm out of Indianapolis as well with Damon, also a member of the Kepler Institute. Uh, specifically, uh, relative to uh, this space, um, I'm also a member owner and um, member of the steering committee of the KI Construction Cooperative. We're a uh, fledgling, um, uh, newly established uh, shared service cooperative that works to support and coalesce the skills of uh, other fledgling construction business owners. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Marilyn Butler. Marilyn Butler. Uh, so is it maybe she's dropped off? No, I'm here. Oh, I am is. here. I oh, guess yeah. I did too many clicks on my mic, so it muted and unmuted and muted again. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Marilyn Butler. I'm a retired nurse and I am a CEO of MP Butler Education and Healthcare Systems. I um, work with the uh, Plantation Park Heights Urban Farm in Baltimore, Maryland, and I'm a board member there. And I'm here interested in learning about co-ops and how we can better our urban farm situation. Great. I've been hearing good things about the farm up in Park Heights, so I've, I've seen that there's several of you associated with that here. Um, did Laurent did? LaRon, get back on. I saw he was off. Yes, sir, I'm here. I'm sorry. My power, my internet, my own. Everyone off. LaRon yeah. Martin. I'm co-founder of Virtual Village Learning and Support with Tiffany Page. Yeah, thank you. Um, I saw a name that came up that said Farmer Chippy. Was that? Hey, good morning, everyone. Farmer Chippy, Plantation Park Heights, Urban Farm CEO. I'm um, sorry, Executive Director. Talking about last year. This is This is a new role. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we got a farm. It's awesome. It's uh, it's in the center of Baltimore, and our intention is to train up the next generation of America's farmers. Um, we're trying to form a co-op so that we can share resources, and we're very interested in ESOP, so all that type of stuff. We're interested in um, no owner, uh, shared resources, uh, low cost, broad and base, um, everyone involved. Thanks. Thank you. Um, there's someone with the letter C that shows up on the screen. I'm not sure who that is. That might just be me. I'm connected also for my phone as a caller, so you can ignore nice. that person. Okay. All right. Is there anyone who I had not, have not mentioned? Yes, please. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Jill Gordon, and I am also with Plantation Park Heights Urban Farm. I am the school outreach coordinator, and we are going to be putting in place a working um, produce garden um, with vegetables and herbs and flowers at in each uh, elementary, middle school, and park heights. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, all of you. Is there uh, anyone else? Okay, looks like we've gone around the bases. So the reason I did that is because it's important for others to know who you are, but also one is for you to know who you are. And I say that in a you know somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, you know oftentimes we. I don't know if that's me doing that now, or that might be that phone that's on. Uh, at any rate, oftentimes it's challenging um, to you know establish an identity for an organization or for an enterprise. And it can be even more challenging to articulate that to people. So the next note that you see here, I guess on my, my, my presentation is called the elevator pitch. And many of you probably have heard that term. Some of you may have already perfected that and just didn't choose to share it at this particular time. But when people ask me um, you know, about my company, I tell them that Adrian Harpo Associates uh, Yep, that's, that's me there. <laughs> I forgot I had the picture up. Adrian Harpool Associates is a, uh, a black owned company um, and we um, shape policy opinion, <clears throat> policy opinion relationships and outcomes for nonprofit, corporate, institutional and government clients. We assist them in identifying their options and opportunities as obstacles 
and then also work with them on strategies to meeting their goals. And it's important to have, they use the term elevator, and it's so funny in this pandemic environment we're in now, people don't think to rush on an elevator anymore, and who knows how many of us will be doing that anytime soon. But the term elevator pitch comes from if you got on an elevator with someone and we're going up two or three floors, could you, and they ask you, hi, how are you, who are you, what do you do? Could you explain that in the time that the elevator got to your floor or to, or to their floor? <clears throat> and so it is important to have a succinct, prepare a succinct description of your enterprise and how, and then most importantly, um, how it improves or supports a potential prospect. Um, while many of us often think that we know who our market is, and we'll talk about that stuff in a minute, uh, but you sometimes never know who is in the position to use your business, to um, to support your, your your enterprise, or to refer you to others. And so uh, it is important to have that sort of a, an elevator pitch ready and uh, be able to tell people what you do and how what you do can, can, uh, can further their cause. Can we move to the next uh, slide, please? Uh, back one. Okay, it looks like um, there is a, maybe I did send you the wrong one, but that's okay. We'll move to the next one then, please. Um, we will dive right into this. So what I wanna share with you is what I'm, what I'm calling the elements of effective marketing strategy. And I'll try to put it in a context that makes it useful for you all. Um, there are five elements, as I know them. There are a number of others that some might um, be more finite, but I think for our purposes of our conversation today, I want to kind of focus on these five. Uh, branding is that first one, which again is who are you? You know, what do you? Who do you say you are? What's the name of your enterprise? Um, and and in some cases, people incorporate a logo, as you'll see down the bottom corner. Um, we've developed a logo for my company. And it's a brand so that when people see us in different places, we have them on T-shirts, we have them on jackets, we have them on our business cards. People see that and they relate to that um, that logo there as a, a means of being able to identify when we are present. And logos can be very effective. They can, you know, again, you think about some very some very dominant logos. Probably one of the most valuable logos. And, and it's competing right now. There's a strong competition between these two individuals as well as the two companies as well as uh, their brands. But one of the most dominant logos in the world is the Apple logo for Apple computers. And, um, you know, they don't even use their name anymore. They just show that um, that silhouette of a, uh, a bitten out uh, Macintosh Apple. As you know, the company, the, the, the computers are called Macs. And it's based on their first, uh, one of the early computers, which was called the Macintosh. And so that silhouette demonstrates, you know, you see that, you recognize it. Uh, the Nike swoosh is another one that most people are familiar with. You see that little symbol and you know right away whether the word Nike is there or not, you know what that means. More increasingly, one that's come on the scene in the last several years, but has become dominant in the world and, and certainly in, this, in the United States and, and in this particular region we're in here in Baltimore and other places is Amazon. And Amazon uses something similar to the Nike Swish. It's a, it's actually it looks like a smile. As you see that little like arrow that uh, goes in this kind of shape. And actually that smile, the, the initial Amazon um, logo and again the way they positioned it was that they had everything from a to z and so that that switch went from the a to a z and and now they've eliminated even the the the, the a to z and oftentimes you'll just see that little um that little arrow that again resembles and looks like a smile um that represents the amazon brand but those are examples of highly effective highly uh recognizable brands, and there are many others, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, those are some that have been considered for a long time. Those are the icons that would be viewed to be the most valuable and most recognizable around the world. And the point I'll make to you about brands is that brands are, are important. We'll talk about brands in a moment in more detail, 
but it isn't all about the brand. Um, and the brand is not all just a visual symbol. It also uh, reflects the spirit and the, um, and the DNA, if you will, of an organization or of a, of a product or of a company. Uh, the second uh, thing we'll talk about briefly is promotion. Uh, promotion is, again, how you promote the company. And so many other things, and I see there is an error here. I'll get to uh, someone will get fired for that. I'm saying that jokingly because I did this myself, which is I may get fired. My assistant always will give me the devil when I don't run these things past her before uh, I present them. But um, the second thing, promotion, uh, a promotion is, a you know, how do you promote your brand? How do you promote your company? And that can be done in any number of ways. Sometimes that's in signage. As you'll see, again, I mentioned Amazon. You see the trucks when they're going by, you know, an Amazon truck. Again, they don't even put the name on it sometimes. It's just a, that little smile thing. Um, but um, promotion can be done, you know, visually through advertising, billboards. We'll talk about advertising in a moment. But the various types of promotion that you'll see um, Handing out flyers on the street is promotion. Uh, you know, going out to events and networking is promotion. There are a lot of various forms of promotion, and it's important to always find ways, new ways, but also, of course, effective ways to promote your business, your product. And, you know, that'll be relative to the resources you have available. So many people say, you know, we don't have money to do this or do that. There are all kinds of approaches to promotion. Um, T-shirts, for example, many I mentioned to you earlier that we use them. Hats. There are all kinds of different things that people will use. Your business card is a promotional product. So a promotion is criti critical. Uh, it could be a sign in your window. It could be your window um, that is, um, you know, blazing with your, your logo or your company's name. The hours, that sort of thing is promotion. So we want to talk about promotion as we go through this. And what I'm hoping to do here today is not make this a lecture. I know it sounds like I'm lecturing now, but what I'd like us to do is talk about a few of these things and then let's go into sort of a sort of a you know conversation, if you will. Um, I'm glad to answer questions. If people have specific challenges they want to present, then you know I'd like to work with you all in, in unraveling some of that. And maybe some of those of you there that have solved some of the problems that people are presenting can offer your um, your remedies or your suggestions for how you've overcome those. The third one I mentioned here is advertising. And advertising takes on a lot of different forms. So you have everything from television advertising to radio advertising. And then you have billboards, as I mentioned. We see buses go by, there are ads on buses, magazines and newspapers, and increasingly, uh, we are seeing advertising in digital spaces, on the internet, both through social media, on websites, and um, in almost everything that you open up. You do a search, as you know, you go to search for one thing, and there's a half a dozen ads. Google's posted ads, Facebook's posting ads, uh, whatever search engine you're using is is posting ads and putting them in front of you. And we've, you know, we've really leveraged now what's called um, artificial intelligence, which really begins to track your media usage. And, and it's sometimes it's, uh, it's actually even frightening, to be honest. You know, you can look for something on your computer, a particular product or service, or just happen to click an ad. And then a day later, or even 10 minutes later, you can go onto social media, Facebook or Instagram, and here's an ad for a product or that's similar to the type of product you looked at. Um, so artificial intelligence is being used increasingly in the digital advertising space. And even with modest budgets, it is possible to leverage that and utilize some of those tactics as well. We'll talk about some of that in a moment. Um, this next thing that, that says advertising in number four actually shouldn't be advertising. But we can go back to that, um, to the circle. Yeah, that actually should have said, um, and I'm just back look, looking back at my notes, public relations, advertising, promotion, and I think that next one was, um, hmm, forgive me. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to I'm going to skip that because I'm not I, I, some I don't have my notes. The notes I'm have in front of me don't reflect what's on this uh, PowerPoint. So let's move to public relations. The public relations is what's often called earned media. Um, but it's it's also what the public thinks, what people say about you outside of an advertising setting. So, for example, an article in the paper about your, your organization or your company is considered public relations. If you are on TV, if you're being interviewed by a local TV station or you're interviewed on a radio program, those are forms of public relations. Uh, public relations can sometimes take the form of what I'm doing now when you go out and do public speaking or you uh, participate in organ other events and the like and you have an opportunity to talk about your organization. That's promotion, but it's also a form of public relations. And public relations can be very effective because its real value is to provide what's called um, an implied endorsement or third party endorsement. And so, you know, you can say what you like about your own product and about your own company. <laughs> People will hear that and you can be very effective with that, but it's yours. And it's just like when you have a child, um, you know, you everybody thinks their baby is the cutest baby in the world or their grandchild is the cutest child in the world. And, you know, people can hear you say that. Oh, isn't my baby cute? Well, that's fine. But until somebody else says your baby's cute, <laughs> people don't typically believe it. And so the most effective um, promotion you can get is someone else saying something good about your brand or about your product or about your company. And that's, um, that's typically what happens in a public relations setting. Generally, public relations, while you may be given an opportunity to speak, the, imp the implication here is that if I'm in the newspaper, someone thought I was worthy of attention, and hopefully what they said about me was good. If I'm on television, hopefully what was said about us is good and it is, is, um, is positive. And so you will see, as you hear oftentimes, I use a good a local company. Again, it has a very strong logo, a very strong brand, but that's Under Armour. And so, you know, when, uh, five years ago, I remember 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to work with them. I thought I'd gone to heaven. You know, wow, Under everybody's like, oh, I want to get Under Armour as a client. Their stock literally has fallen significantly since that time. And, you know, there have been some missteps, miscues on the part of its founder on a part of their board. Um, they moved into some major development activity that now has, has been pivoted, but they got quote unquote a black eye for a lot of that. And as a result, um, you know, f the public opinion is not as favorable as it was at one time. And while the brand may be, again, it, it's probably, it's, from what I hear it's suffering too in the marketplace, but while people may not be as clear as they could be or be as tuned in as they could be, about the challenges that Under Armour is having in the community that it's that it lives in, um, the fact is that the brand here doesn't carry the weight that it want, did once before, both from the consumer side or from the standpoint of of business leaders or political leaders. So public relations is very important. It's key, and when you can use it in what we call it again earned media, that's the media that you don't buy, that you don't actually pay for. Um, the other types of advertising are, are things that you pay for. So you can you can buy an ad on Facebook. You can buy an ad in the paper. You can buy an ad in a magazine or on television. But you earned media is a different type of thing, and it's something that you get. Um, you you sort of you earn as a result of hopefully something you've done that's positive. So if we could move to the next slide, please, Adriana. So just to talk again a little bit about this branding. And I, and I use that, and I, I want to focus on that because a lot of people put a lot of stock in what they, you know, they believe branding to be. People are saying, my brand, we got to develop a brand, we got to develop a logo. So let's examine that a little bit more closely. Um, you know, first is, is, is the focus of a brand. Um, it adapts to your needs, captures your audience attention. Again, so you want something that people can see, can recognize, and believe that when they see that or hear that, they know what you're talking about and they know what the person, someone else is talking about. The second thing is this, this nation, this notion of, um, of feeling. And so how does a brand, hearing about a brand make you feel? You know, what is there that you, what is it that it emotes? 
right? Um, again, we'll use Nike as an example. People, you know, that one of the more famous kind of taglines with Nike is, let, is just do it, right? And so talked about determination. You think about athletes to the determined. And, and Nike always connects itself to winners. So, I mean, I think about, you know, a um, guy named Jeff Speaks um, that's a, a golfer. Um, they recently had and just discontinued a relationship with Misty Copeland, who's a ballet dancer, African-American, the first principal dancer in the, um, in the, um, uh, the Met Met Metropolitan Ballet. Um, and, and so, you know, but she was prominent at that time and she was a winner and she was somebody who was a, became a, people become icons. And so you'll see Steph Curry, you'll see all these kinds of folks that um, these brands clamor to around, the, the Nike brand is clamored around because it wants to associate that with itself, with the feeling of success and, and, and winning. Individuality is important also in a brand. You, know, you want your brand to stand alone and stand aside. You want people not to confuse you with others. And so in choosing a name for your organization, your company, your enterprise, it's important to think, how do you differentiate yourself from those others that are out there in the marketplace? What makes us different? How can I express that when I talk about our company or our enterprise or our co-op? How do we, you know, maybe there's a geographic. I heard several times that people talk to me, I heard the people from the farm all mention Park Heights. Okay. And so I don't know if Park Heights is officially in the name of the um, in the organization's brand, but it is important if that's the case because it gives people a geographic reference. For people who don't are not from Baltimore, and again, let's talk about a product like farm produce, right? Um, these days, you're only shipping that so far. People are looking at farm to table, and while we get a lot of produce still from Mexico and from South America and other places, people typically want produce that's from somewhere nearby. It's fresher. Um, and then those folks who have allergies and other kind of issues oftentimes need to because not to get too deep in this, but the whole pollinization of plants um, is relative to, you know, is ge geography and people's um, existence in that same space. So you want to make sure that you express the individuality. I heard a couple of you talk about being from Indiana. Um, there was also some references to Southern Nevada and in specific reference to Las Vegas. So you wanna make sure that if there is some value, whether it's political value, whether it's again, emotional, or whether there's a connection based on uh, where something is located. New York is a great example of that. People know New York when they hear it, right? And people who are New Yorkers love New York, no matter where they live now, they always relate to New York as home. So when you hear something that has New York associated with it, it it, it gins a certain type of response from New Yorkers or people who relate to the experiences they've had there. So you want that individuality. And then I'm mentioning now experience. Uh, your brand, you want to be able to promote what the what is the experience? You know, what is it that someone should expect or anticipate coming from their association with your brand? So I'm going to use the farm thing again here. Um, if you've got a farm, is your, is your is your produce fresh? You know, is it tasty? Is whatever it is, you know, so that's the experience, right? And you want to make sure that you're able to articulate and somehow give people a sense of what they should experience when they uh, encounter your brand. Consistency is important. Uh, consistency, again, I had a great experience. I had a, an apple from the, um, or let's, let's maybe get closer to the, um, I had some fruit or whatever it is from uh, from the Park Heights uh, farm, and it was sweet, and I loved it. But the next time I had it, wasn't so sweet. Didn't love it so much. Um, the third, maybe the third time, I maybe I didn't even buy it the second third time because it was, yeah. You know, after my second experience, nah, you know, it looks like that's uneven. And so you want to be able to be sure whatever the product is, whatever the service. I heard they talk about a construction co-op. You know, people are going to look at the work that you all do and evaluate that. And the question again is, is the work that you do, is what you deliver consistent? You know, uh, they did a great job on this house, but 
you know, a friend of mine bought a house and they did some work there and brought them in and, you know, the hinges came off the door, you know, and, and that's back to the whole notion again about public relation and promotion because word of mouth back to that, you know, what the people's, what are people saying? You can say what you want to say about it, but the truth of it is people are going to believe what they hear from folks who have experience with your brand. So you want to make sure that you are able to be consistent, but also you've got to, again, if you can communicate uh, consistency in your brand. So if it's a positioning statement, again, um, you know, if it's construction, you know, we stand up to the task, we're on time, right? Construction, that's always an issue for people. Is construction done on schedule? Is it done on budget? Do we use high quality products? Do we have skilled workers, experienced workers? Uh, or, you know, and again, back to the experiential and the feeling, you know, maybe it's we are, we've hired, we put returning citizens to work. We put veterans. I heard someone mention they were veteran earlier. You know, is that's that may be, again, from the standpoint of feeling and a standpoint of individuality that, you know, we're veteran owned or we, you know, and veterans we know served our country and people feel like we owe a debt to veterans. So maybe you want to incorporate that in the name of your enterprise. Credibility is important. I mentioned that a little bit of, it's kind of goes hand in hand with consistency, but you know, do you have credibility? What are people saying about you again? You know, um, do you, you know, are, we talk about the news and I mentioned public relations, but you know of companies that you've heard about where there's been, there've been problems and I'm going to use one now and I'm almost fearful to do this because I, I want to let you know that I'm promoting um, vaccination for um, for COVID-19. Um, I lost my wife a year ago Thursday. Um, she was an early victim of COVID. And, and I'm saying that because recently we've heard some things about Johnson & Johnson and their vaccine. And so people are like, oh, I, don't, I knew there was something wrong. I didn't want to take that. Heard about Johnson, you know, and, and they bring up stuff for Johnson & Johnson, not related to the vaccine, but for other products <coughs> they had some years ago, that affects, that affects their credibility. <clears throat> and so now people are saying, I'm okay with the Pfizer vaccine, I'm okay with the Moderna vaccine, but I don't want the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And so credibility, again, for your product, for your program, your enterprise is critical. Longevity can be important and also can be a part of brand. Many of us have seen advertising for different companies that say, in business since 1952, um, you know, in business. I laugh sometimes because some of these companies are 10 years old, but they say in business since 2000, you know, 2001, you know, to, you know. So, but longevity is also another thing that you can incorporate into a brand if you have that opportunity. So many times you'll see where something has been, you know, 25th anniversary or the 50th anniversary or 50 years in service. Those things mean something because they speak again to consistency. They speak to credibility. A company would not still be in business if they, in 50 years, if it was, you know, doing inferior, providing inferior products or inferior services. So longevity can be a part of your brand essence. Then there's the personal aspect. So I'll use myself as an example. My company's name, Adrian Harpo Associates. And I had a, a firm that we ran for about 15 years, um, pretty successful. It's called 21st Century Group. We started it back in 1996. We were thinking forward to the year 2000 and moving into the 21st century. And we wanted to be, you know, show that we were progressive and that we were cutting edge, a lot of technology in our space. And we ran that company for about 15 years, but about four or five years into it, my partner and I had challenges. Um, and, you know, um, again, it's just human hu hu humanity, but people were not remembering the name of the company. What happened was people were saying, oh, yeah, you need to call Adrian Harpool and those guys, right? And they would say, oh, yeah, Adrian Harpool. Yeah, call, you know, I work with Adrian Harpool's company. They did a great job. And my partner's name was otherwise, right? So he, he kind of 
would get concerned about that because people were not saying 21st century group. We ultimately closed that company down, not because of that, but just um, a shift in the market. Um, but when I started the next enterprise, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to use my name because people have been calling it that anyway. And most of the people who I worked with, you know, clients and others and, and contractors, you know, related to me and they still do. And so I decided I'd use Adrian Harpool Associates and I've been doing that now for um, about 10 years or better, maybe 15 years. And it's worked fine. <laughs> um, I remember as a kid, I didn't like the name Adrian and Harpool was pretty weird too, but I grew into it. Um, just as I did my ears, I grew into it and, um, and I'm comfortable with that now, but that's, again, you know, it's a very personal kind of thing and back to credibility, back to consistency, back to experience. Um, you know, this is like my last thing out. If my name doesn't work, I'm in trouble. If I get, if I do something that causes me to be on the front page of the paper, um, you know, it's not going to be like I worked for, you know, the, I don't know, um, Bluefields organization or something, and I could change the name of the organization. I'm not going to do, I'll, I'll probably not change my name anytime soon. And and even if I did, some people would recognize me and say, yeah, you're calling yourself something else, but weren't you Adrian Harpool before? So I make that point because it's just got to be uh, the, the personal aspect. If you want to incorporate that, bear in mind that it does have some liabilities as well as advantages. And that also speaks to individuality. But um, finally, portability is important. Um, you want a name and you want a brand that you can use in a number of different settings. And you want to make sure that it plays well in, in different in different kind of environments. And so, you know, while again, the Park Heights thing is great, you know, for, for the farm, because that's where you're located. Um, if you were doing work in Indiana, if you began to sell your produce there, Park Heights wouldn't mean anything to people there. You know, they'd be, where's that at? You know, so, um, so again, you want to, but again, based on the, the market that you all are promoting to, and I mentioned, I think people are, you know, looking to farm the table. So yeah, I know where Park Heights is, you know, and, and, and there's some other, um, other associations with Park Heights in terms of the community it represents, it's upward mobility, um, there are some, you know, some other challenges that Park Heights as a brand has. I'm very familiar with that community. And um, and I think that what this organization, is my mind, hopes to do is change uh, the perception of the public about that community and bring forth a product that that community can be proud of and others can, um, can associate with success. So I'm going to stop there for a moment before we go to the next slide and see if people have questions. I saw, I've been seeing stuff come up in the chat. I guess I need to go into, is there a chat or something here that I'm not seeing? Um, notes that are coming up. Um, are there questions that people have that you wanna, wanna talk some about this before um, I go any further? Uh, I asked a quick, qu oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, I was gonna ask um, uh, Adriana uh, to, <clears throat> go in and post these, there are a few comments in the chat. Um, Tiffany's giving a, 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 a asking a question. Um, Tiffany, was that you who was just trying to talk? I believe so. Yeah, yes, sir, it was. I was just gonna ask really quickly, did you suggest um, personal branding on top of what it is that we're you know already doing with our own cooperatives? Did you also suggest that we do some things to maybe begin to brand ourselves personally? Um, it, 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 it depends on how well, you, how, how, how good of a job you've already done with the cooperative. Um, you know, the term, they say you can't serve two masters. And so you don't want people to be confused as to what you represent. If you have got, if you're all in with the cooperative, you know, then that needs to be the brand that you lead with. Um, at some point, it, there does come a time when people again may associate you with the brand, you know, your personal brand with the corporate brand. And I think that's fine um, because again, it, it tend, can, can lead more credibility to the brand. 
Um, if you have personal integrity, if you have a personal skill or talent that, you know, reflects on the brand in a positive way, then that's good too. But I think that you, you certainly want to, um, you certainly want, if you're in the fledgling stages of the brand, of branding the co-op, I think you really want to lean hard and do what's possible to get people to, to understand uh, the, the co-op's brand and what it experience, what experience and what it brings and its credibility and, and the value. And a term that I have not used yet as it relates to brand is equity. And, and I know that means a lot of things, but brand equity. The question is, what is the value of your brand, right? What does that mean to people? And and so, as I mentioned, Under Armour, for example, it's lost a lot in brand equity through some of the challenges that it's had because where it was a really strong brand at one time, uh, the logo is still recognizable, but people don't have the same um, opinion of it or, or don't value it in the same way. So you want to make sure that you... Um, consider brand equity. And I also always bring that up when people talk about changing the name of something, right? Well, we're going to change our name. We're going to change our, it's like, that's fine if your brand doesn't have any equity. But if people have already bought into what you do, what your product is or your service is, you know, based on the name, changing the name could really put you at a disadvantage because people won't recognize who you are anymore. So uh, that that's a probably long-winded answer to that short question, but I, I wouldn't suggest you try to do both at once. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. This is Khalil in Africa. Excuse me. <clears throat> Again, out of Indianapolis. Thank you for your presentation so far. Appreciate it. Um, I was just thinking we were having a conversation in our space of the day about you know advertising. Again, I share we are a fledgling uh, a construction cooperative, and one of the brothers was talking about well. We do want to share our, you know, get our name out there, but there is a, a balance with getting too much, uh, uh, too many requests and not being able to honor them relative to your credibility. But more, we looking at really kind of strategies. How do you maybe more, uh, specifically market certain, you know, to certain entities where you want a lot of exposure, but not necessarily to the public? Because, you know, that balance of trying to, you know, uh, target the right, but not, uh, damage your your brand or credibility because you can't serve the need as well. So just can talk about that. So thank yeah, you, sir. That's an important consideration. And I will say this to you, just as you promote your brand, um, as I talked about the elevator speech, um, you you've twice said you're a fledgling uh, cooperative. Um, I would suggest that you consider the term we're growing cooperative, and that's oh. a little difference because from the standpoint of confidence. Um, you know, we have confidence in that we're growing. Fledgling sounds like you just kind of, you know, we're, we, we know we're, we're in, and, and it's, and it's, 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 I appreciate the humility that's in that because some people would be just all bravado, like, yeah, we, we the baddest thing out here, you know, no, but, but say we're a growing cooperative because that's a, that, that emotes that you are in a progressive state, but also people then want to buy into your growing. Right. So they want to help us grow. Right. Um, but so to your other, but to your question, um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of that things about how do you figure out who you, who you're marketing to and, and how do you, particularly if you have limited resources, you want to market, you want to fine tune and, um, and target your market. Um, because there are people who will make that mistake. They'll get out here and you know, you've got more business than you can manage. That's like, if you go to a, you go to a restaurant and people are standing in line, right? I'll give you a good example of that. Anybody know about the Popeye's um, chicken sandwich? <laughs> if, do they have those all over the country? <laughs> right. So Popeye's chicken sandwich. So it, I mean, they went, they was, that thing was crazy. They were actually, there was actually someone who got killed in DC over a Popeye's chicken sandwich. I mean, two guys got into a, a, a skirmish in the store, and they were out in the parking lot, and one guy shot another guy. But um, I have a brother who was in a nursing home. And he loves those sandwiches. He loves them. And and I go to try to visit him once a week. We have not had visits lately in nursing homes because of COVID-19. So what I've done now over the last six months or better, every like to, I'll do it today. Every Saturday or Sunday, I go through the Popeyes and I get them chicken sandwiches and I drop them off at the front door for him. And that's great. 
But let me tell you, there have been a couple times that I've gone to Popeye's and I could not get into the parking lot. I mean, people are in line buying the chicken sandwiches. And that turned into a negative experience because they created something that was great, that people love it, but the demand was greater than they could supply. And I've been in other situations where I went there and they were out. We're just out, straight up. People come in and buy 20 and buy 30 of those things and they're out. So to your point, you don't want to be in a position where you are creating a demand that you can't satisfy. So it's wise to have that consideration. I think what you may want to do is take a look again at, in those instances, you want to take a look at a couple things. Some of that is could be pricing, right? Um, you, we would, we would, what was I heard recently? Was someone was talking about, um, talking about racism and they were talking about discrimination. And they were saying in this particular bit, particular store, you don't have to tell black folks not to come there because the prices tell them not to come there. <laughs> you know, um, and what I'm saying is that in some instances, you may want to take a look at where, from a product standpoint, from the services that you offer, right? What do you what do you do best? What do you have the best or the highest profit margin for? And then maybe focus on delivering that one product or that one service um, profitably, right? Because you don't have to be everything to all people. You know, you just need to be a few things to people who can afford that and who you can reliably uh, serve. So I say that, that sometimes when you, you talk about demand, demand can be driven by people. We had a, a we had a retailer here in Baltimore and in, a, in the Washington region called Luskins. It was a electronic store. It predated um, Best Buy. It predated um, a, num- a number of other companies. And, and Luskins, their, their tagline was the cheapest guy in town. And, and ultimately what happened is these other companies came in the, in, in the, into the marketplace, Best Buy, Circuit Cities, others. <clears throat> they ran Luskins out of business because <clears throat> they didn't have as much variety in products. And it turned out that people wanted variety. They weren't as concerned about the cheap price as they were about having more access to products. So it's important, again, to know what, what business you're in, what your product mix is, how you're priced, and um, and then what you want to be known for. And so, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, pardon me, Adrian. I, I wanted to ask, uh, get back to Khalil's uh, question about the construction company and 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 being able to um, manage the flow of business. And so, my question is, is if you in a business that has multiple services or multiple products, and maybe one product um, excels or one skill set excels beyond the other, how do you market that? So like a bakery, bakery may make good um, all things, breads and rolls, but they may be known for their pie, a Pacific pie. And in his, to respond to his question, maybe in a construction company, there's services that they do. There's one service that excels beyond the other. Maybe it's right. the carpentry versus the other, some other services. So how do you market that um, that specific service or product that, that becomes well known and well appreciated above others? Well, so, so you, you know, you, one, you lead with that and you can incorporate that as part of your, um, you know, part of your elevator speech, part of your, um, you know, positioning statement. So, um, you know, I can think of some companies that do like we have some companies here in this area and they do um, a lot of different things. One of them is called Brothers Services. I think they might even be a franchise. They're all around the country, a construction company. Right. But what they've been focusing on recently in their advertising is roofing. And they offer a roofing, quote unquote, roofing special, um, you know, X dollars. Um, what it, what they've enabled themselves to do is really be getting, getting become known for that roofing work. They are able to buy that product, the you know the products for roofing, at a really high volume, which represents a lower cost. And then subsequently, you know they can offer that at a lower cost to their customer, and they have a higher profit margin on that work because they basically hire guys to do roofing. I don't know that they do plumbing. 
I don't know that they do electrical work, but I know they do roofing. And so they pretty much lead with that. Now, what is interesting is in a construction business, as you know, people, if you go in and you do good work, let's say it's roofing at this point, you go in and you do roof, you got a customer now. <clears throat> now that customer has another need in the construction industry. Uh, <clears throat> they need a door put on in <clears throat> <coughs> they need windows. They're still going to call you. They're going to say, hey, you know, Khalil, do you guys do windows? Right? And you have a choice to do that or not do that. But, um, you know, you want to really take a look at, and I, again, I go back to, um, you know, that those variables, the profit margin, and then what's the need in your community? I mean, what do people really need done? You know, it doesn't, doesn't help you. If you're in an area that doesn't, um, you're in Indiana, did you say? Yes, sir. Indianapolis. Okay. Yeah. So you're in Indiana and, um, you know, weather conditions there, it's not Florida. Um, and so the conditions of Florida are different. So there's some aspects of construction that, you know, people are probably more concerned about weatherization, I would imagine, in Indiana than they are in Florida, for example. Um, they probably heat is more important than air conditioning. You know, so there's some things that you can key in on, you know, based on the environment that you're in. And, and and then try to really promote or focus products or services that speak to that need. Yeah, yeah, and, and I appreciate, brother. First of all, I want to thank you for the the, the clarification about the verbiage. Appreciate that. That's an important note that you made. And uh, to add to brother Ron's comment, um, it's it, that's something we're thinking about in this past 30, 60 days. I don't mean to belabor this point for the rest of the group, but just to share this, you know, it's been a we've been in a lot of landscaping work and we have to have a, one of our contractors, a landscaper, you know, but that's not where we want to live. You know, we want to our focus wants to be in residential renovation. We really like doing bathrooms, you know, really roughing in and with in, in new construction because that's where our sweet spot is with our current group kind of the balance of the cooperative, you working with the resources that are there. So you want to market your work, but like, you know, Brother Ron said, but you also want to point yourself in other directions, you know, as well with your marketing and balance again at the same time, blowing yourself up and your phone ringing off the hook and you can't meet, you know, to go get a quote and the estimate going through that process is just in itself, you know, a, a process. So uh, just really, yeah, you appreciate the, you focus me to think about more intentionality about the, you know, our, our targets and so forth. So, and, and I would say around that quote and estimate thing. So back to the, I mentioned your brother services is doing roofing, right? What they did is they established packages. So like, for example, if landscaping is not what you want to be doing, but you're doing some of it, the work's coming in, right? Um, create a package that is typical of the type of work that you get and then price that and maybe do that on three levels so it's three tiers right we got an economy you see this a lot of times in certain types of products here's an economy here's our standard and then here's our premium right and so you're just working at three price points and in those three price points you got an assembly your premium your, your economy may be you know you get shrubs only right and then your your standard may be shrubs and flowers or flower bed and then your other one might be some stuff, some, you know, premium maybe. And so just like kind of create those three products. And then based on what you know, your costs are associated with that, the, the man hours typically to go into it, the products that you got to buy to, to provide that. And then set those three price points and basically just offer that. Because then you're not out doing estimates, right? You're basically saying, here's what we do based on these prices. And the customer can select for themselves Right. I'm spending a thousand dollars. I'm spending fifteen hundred dollars. I'm spending three thousand dollars. And and the customer knows where they fit in there based on their budget, you know. And when they call you, you also know how much you can expect to get because, you know, that's what the deal is, you know. And that, and that thousand dollar package comes with this. Now you get there and someone says, well, can you add this, that, the other? Yeah, but it's going to be at some additional cost. But at least you know, because you could spend a lot of time out there doing estimates for people who don't even use your service, right? Because they weren't going to spend $1,000, you know, but they brought you out there. And, and if you say, well, which package you want, you know, they, they, and put that on your website or whatever, and then go from there. I'm just saying that's, but that's just one scenario. And whether that's bathrooms, if the bathroom remodeled, same thing. You can do, here's our basic package. We're replacing the sink. 
you know, in a toilet. We're facing a sink, a toilet, a tub. We do, you know, whatever that is. The two piece, three piece, like you know, like the chicken places. You can get a two piece, you can get a three piece bathroom. You know, you can get the full thing. Um, and and you know, create packages. Look at some standard products that go along with that. Here's a standard toilet that's in that package. Here's a standard tub. Here's a standard shower at the head. And then that's what we're selling. But you already have your pricing set because you've already determined what your costs are associated with that. You know how many man hours it takes or woman hours it takes to do an install for that kind of thing. And then you can sell those things based on those packages and just go on automatic. I think, one of, the, I think one of the benefits of that, too, as, a, as an entrepreneur is that it allows you to kind of optimize your process in that particular vertical. And so what you're able to do is to bring other people on, train them in that process. You already know the margins. And from a marketing standpoint, you can optimize so many channels to really focus on that vertical in your company to where it's kind of running itself which allows you to free your time up to do more R&D business development in the areas that you want to grow in as an entrepreneur. Hmm. Um, so I could move on to the next slide if you want at this point. And, Thank you. Yeah. And maybe later on we can come back to some other stuff for, unless someone else has another question right now. Okay. Um, Adriana, can you help us? I, I just had one point and then I'll shut up. Um, the, the, I, I saw one of those kind of um, strategies in your marketing plan, um, say advertising twice, but I know one that we lean on a lot is just relational and relationship marketing. There's so many tools you can use from text messaging and newsletters to social media, which is free to have a direct relationship with your customer base that you control. So that's 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 one marketing channel that we lean on a lot in our space. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to talk about some of those things here. Um, so, you know, and there's a number of different elements here, and I'll try to move through them pretty quickly. Most of you are familiar with a lot of these. Um, so the integration of offline marketing is important, too. And that's sort of what you meant, like, in, well, not entirely, but, you know, again, that networking, you know, getting out in the community, having conversations, uh, responding to RFPs, um, submitting unsolicited bids, um, you know, again, back to, you know, back to the, um, you know, back to the uh, construction scenario. Um, if you've got a basic door hanger kind of thing that you created that gives you an opportunity to, to promote your services and you ride through the neighborhood and you see somebody's uh, gutter falling, you know, hanging down, you know, you can easily put a door hanger on their doorknob you know, <laughs> when they come home that evening, you know, they may, they just may not have taken the time to go look for somebody to come fix that. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's low hanging fruit you can identify. Uh, social media marketing is something that many of you are already aware of. There are a lot of different ways to um, do that effectively. I won't try to get into that too much here now. And I will, um, what I will do, um, Ron, Adriana, you let me get into the this coming week i'll forward you um a little powerpoint that we have on that that i think could be useful to, to some of the folks here um search engine optimization as you know if you go online and you're beginning to do any kind of a search where do you show up in that setting um we don't show up very high in that kind of situation and i will tell you it's because we're not a b2c company we don't sell to the average consumer uh, the average person company that hires us is not finding us, um, you know, through doing a search online. Most of our business comes through referral. And on the other end of that, I do a lot of scouting. I do a lot of, um, you know, targeted search myself for opportunities and approach companies with an offering or try to establish a relationship um, that leads to a sale. But uh, so, but search, I, I search, Engine optimization is important to be able to show that you have used certain keywords and phrases, images that can help you, particularly around social media, um, can help you to get uh, eyeballs on on your offering or on your enterprise. Uh, blogging can be helpful too. Um, it can, uh, admittedly, it can help you know to show it, assert your knowledge as an expert in the field. 
or even helped you to, um, uh, you know, raise or elevate your your visibility in a marketplace. Of course, a blog is only as good as the person that reads it from the standpoint that you've got to have a distribution network that gets it out there. Um, you got to, you know, so you kind of oftentimes marry that with your social media. So people who follow you on social media also um, see your blog and go to it. And, and, and you want to have information, that's, I guess the term they use is sticky. You want something that is worth passing on to someone else. You know, when how often do you see an article or do you see something online and you share it with two or three friends? And so if your stuff's not shareable, if it's not interesting enough for someone to pass on, um, it's fine if you just need to soothe your ego or, or if you just got some things you want to get off your chest, if it's that kind of blog. But if you want to be effective, you want to think about the user and, and try to write to a particular type of audience. Uh, email marketing is still effective. And again, but that requires you to have access to a pool of potential readers. So either people that you, if you're out networking and you got business cards or people that you've made contact with previous customers, you know, that you have email addresses for that you can share information that you're having a sale or we're having a special, you know, um, or the crop, this crop is in, you know, this particular, you know, this time of year. Now we got strawberries or whatever that is, is coming out. Um, those things can be communicated uh, via the email marketing very effectively provided you have an audience to send it to. You can buy lists for email. Um, I don't necessarily encourage it. Um, while, while it's a relatively, can be relatively inexpensive, it also can be ineffective. If you, people just get spam and they, you know, you're, you're likely to get turned off, turn off more people than you're going to excite um, with, if you're sending them blind emails to people that you don't know. But if you've got a group, a, a list of people and you want to send them something on a regular basis once a month or once a week, um, that can be a very effective way to stay in touch with previous customers or prospects. Um, and then with that in mind, you want to do a conversion analysis. You know, is the stuff I'm sending out getting to people? So Constant Contact, for example, or MailChimp, which are two email um, marketing um, products, you, you can follow to see who's opened it. Did they open it? Did they click through? Right? Did it, was it returned? Did it bounce back? And then out of those people who did open it or did read your email, how many of those have you been able to convert into conversations or businesses or, or business or customers, clients? Um, number seven here is planning and execution is, is critical. So, you know, you, you've got to plan ahead. You, for example, know, um, we were talking again before about the construction company. If you know winter is coming, you know, like with um, Game of Thrones, when it's coming, then, you know, then you might start to send out stuff about weatherization. You know, you, know, you want to start executing the plan now, planning what you're going to do for the winter and what kind of products or services. If you're doing the landscaping or if you're doing, again, if you're farming, you know the various seasonal turns of the uh, crops that you're working with. And you can begin to plan ahead as to when to promote the availability of certain products um, and um, and how to price them related to the, the, the time that they're available. Uh, management of your of your marketing efforts critical, obviously. It's something you have to pay attention to so that uh, you can't go sleep at the wheel. Uh, if you're doing the same thing all the time. And, and many of us are challenged because we are doing more, we spend more time doing the business, especially if you're a relatively small enterprise, you're spending so much time doing the business that it's difficult to, to, to invest the time to manage, to focus on management. But it's always important to do that. Um, I was going to point out something that was on my whiteboard, but I, we finished it yesterday, so we, so it's down. But uh, we just this past week, because this is a slow, we projected a month ago that this quarter was going to be slow for us. And so we are redoing our website. In fact, I'd invite you all to take a look Monday at our website. Today, if you go up there, you're just going to see a counter telling you that um, it's coming, that it's, you know, a new one's being launched. And I think that counter ran out last night and, um, and the site is being migrated. 
So Monday you'll see a new thing. But the point I'm making is we spent time doing that. We've also spent time working on our infrastructure, our internal digital files. Uh, we're purging a lot of paper files. Uh, we've been looking at our uh, the different, we didn't did an audit on all the money we spend every month on different subscriptions and products and services that we have. And we, we've got a commitment by the end of April to reduce that number by about 20% or 25%. Um, because a lot of the stuff we never use, we never really, never really, um, um, you know, leverage in the way that we intended when we bought it, but we've been paying for it. And some of those things are like automatic payment. You know how to get that stuff that you keep seeing, you keep seeing your email tells you that you paid for something. And you're like, I didn't even know I had that anymore. Um, so anyway, the point I'm making is from a management standpoint, that's what we've been doing recently. Um, I mentioned web design a moment ago. Um, hopefully all of you have a website of some sort. Um, there's some relatively inexpensive ways to get websites done. Um, some very easy kind of uh, one YouTube can talk you through it. A lot of these web, web um, companies have tutorials and hopefully there's someone within your organization or within your circle that can support you in developing a website, but it's also important to maintain a website. Um, if people see the same thing every time they come, they don't come anymore. And not to say that your website has to be so dynamic that it's changing every day, but try to find some creative ways to upgrade and update the information on there. If there's nothing else but the landing page or you know photos that are in the um, in the header, so that when someone comes, they think that there's something different, and it makes them take a different kind of a look, spend a little bit more time uh, on the site. But people will repeatedly they repeatedly see the same thing. They say there's nothing new there. They don't come anymore. Uh, content management is what we just talked about. And then building traffic. And here's where you can marry the web um, web stuff to the social media. Um, you want to be able to find ways to link that back to social media. So you could begin telling a story in a social media setting and have, you know, to hear more or, you know, stop in mid mid paragraph or sentence and have a link that takes them to the website to see the rest of it. Um, and then we talked about search engine marketing a little bit earlier. Um, we can move Adriana, please. Um, so that's pretty much what I had um, to share with you all. Like I said, I'm open to, um, you know, to having some more conversation that people have. I have a question, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, I've been had this question, but I'm going to ask. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the clarity behind your presentation. That's really key to what we're doing here. Um, as you know, we are Plantation Park Heights Urban Farm. We grow fresh food and vegetables with children in the neighborhood for the elderly. So our we're pivoting into Agrihood Baltimore, which uh, we just won a contest with top 10 agriculture innovation teams in the United States. And uh, Agrihood Baltimore is the name. So Agrihood Baltimore is a collection of farms that grow food to feed people locally. And part of this would be attracting children and training children around agriculture in the city so children don't have to leave anymore to go have one one day experience outside of the city. Mm -hmm. right. right. So we're retaining and we're recruiting and we're building a nice little mushroom. But the techniques and strategies that you're presenting today will be so far fetched for those who are now coming on board. So um, as much as I appreciate it, because I've been in business for a long time and my team who is on the call, some of them are, have just transitioned in the last 18 months from uh, employee to employer. Uh, from uh, worker to uh, owner, and from um, careers that they had before to new careers that they always wanted to do. So they didn't have, a lot of people on here don't have the business experience or the savvy that you and I may have. My question to you is, I appreciate this, how do I structure this co-op to onboard people, but at the same time, 
create an, uh, a space to have this type of knowledge shared. So, do you know what uh, I mean? Like, like I do. I do. So, I think there are a couple ways. One of them is um, uh, people are social by nature. So, if we can find ways to deliver this kind of content, I would suggest in about thirty minute um, setting, um, as and and have it serialized. So that every week at a particular time for 30 minutes, you know, you're on a call like this and you have somebody helping to share that kind of stuff. It's also recorded so people have access to it later because many of them, if they are farming or doing the, you know, running the company, they may not always be able to plug in at the particular time, although you could set that up for the evening after dark, hopefully. But by the same token, um, you also want to consider an infrastructure that doesn't require them to know everything. You know, I think if the person is, if they've got a grasp of farming and they're able to make the farm work, they don't have to be a marketing genius. And in all honesty, if you've got a co-op, and we can talk some more about this offline, but if you've got a co-op, that should be one of the values or benefits of the cooperative, that the cooperative provides this kind of support and helps to promote, whether it's the individual farms or the collective. So I would also, you know, again, while I think it's always important for people to uh, build and expand their knowledge base, um, you know, um, it's not necessary for everybody to know how to do everything. And if you can create a, uh, an infrastructure or find support for those people for this part of it, right, um, then let them do what they do <laughs> best or, you know, what they do, make what they can do to make what they make money doing. Like I don't, I haven't washed my car. I don't wash it. I have, in fact, I've had three cars. I've never washed one. I go to car wash because I don't feel like my time is well spent washing my car. I know people who enjoy that and they get out and they just like, they got a toothbrush cleaning the thing. I don't do that, right? Because I can make money doing what I do and I can pay someone else to wash my car. So by the same token, some of your farmers can make more money farming than they can doing social media or doing, um, you know, doing marketing and maybe let them do that and leverage the resources that they have toward somebody else who can do that, you know, do that particular piece. But, um, right. Yeah. So, so so I, quick, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Quick, I'm sorry. Quick double question. Just to add to what you're saying. Uh, one of our colleagues before mentioned the transition from one business model to the next, or how do you concentrate on your marketing and your branding? So we have Plantation Park Ice Urban Farm, which is pretty much well-established visually with logos and all. But Agrihood Baltimore is our new mission, which is the inclusive piece. And mm -hmm. is that piece driven by finance? Can I, like, like I can happily tell you that yeah. we're not happy with the amount of money that we make, even though it's a lot. Sure. We're not happy because we're not where we started to onboard people and empower people. That piece is starting to slip away and we're concentrating on the finances because these people are just throwing money at us because, you know, it's black time. So here, yeah. here, here's some black money. I want to be part of this. I want to be part of this. Here's 10%. I'll give you the other 90, but it's all kinds of financial deals. And I'm happy to entertain them. I've uh, even got some professionals involved. But the question is, are we moving away from our core business model, which was the empowering of our team to build our own thriving economy on our own side so we can share among each other and we, and retain our resources? Do you see what I'm saying? I do. So, so, so do, we, do we go after this big money because they're putting a lot of it? Or, you know. do we, or do we stay focused on empowering our people because at, at the end of this reign of money, who are we? What are we? And our people are still have the and same you, habit of giving you, away their riches to the others. So how do you, and how do you sustain that beyond mm -hmm. this blip? In the because you know, and again, not to be um, insensitive, right? But we know, like just recently, based on what's happened in the Asian community, there's a lot of focus there now, and you know, um, ethnic groups tend to be flavor of the day, right? Some it's it's Latinos this week. Is black folks that's next week, and then it's Asians, and it may be East Indians. So you you know when 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 the sun sets on your on on the flavor that you have, 
right? Where are we going to be when that's all over with? And, and how, how do you leverage? How do you make? So, you know, what I would propose, and I think you need, and I'm not, I didn't come on here to sell anybody anything, um, but we should talk some about strategic planning because I think that that's the base that I, that I, that's the basis of my business is strategic planning. We do marketing as a part of that. And I will tell you honestly, not to, again, take any other, these people off task, but I spoke with someone about your organization uh, a couple of days ago who was here in my office. And I, I don't know if you've met the secretary. He was here sometime with uh, Tom Vilzak, who's the secretary of agriculture. So during the Obama administration, he was secretary and he came to Baltimore a number of times and tried to get a number of things going and wanted to support this effort. And of course, then he was, you know, discharged when the new administration came in. He's back now, and there is some support he can give you and your and your and your co-op. So I offered to try to facilitate that a couple of days ago with someone um, from the Park Heights. Um, um, in fact, with Charmaine, the sister that's running the. Um, Charmaine uh, Davis from the yeah, City yeah, News. Right. Yeah. So I spoke with her. I spoke with her about you all the other day and offered to try to facilitate a meeting with you guys and the secretary. So I don't want to get that off track, but let's do talk again. Thank you so much, man. This is good news. Uh, what, let me just add this to you real quick. Uh, BCF, uh, Baltimore Communica uh, Community Foundation, part of the Baltimore um, Progress Fund, they gave us $30,000 for uh, these things, you know, to get structured. So right. we need to bring an accountant and a case statement, all that type of stuff. So right. I'm so happy to have you, brother, because mm. we're ready and yeah. we're not waiting. We're ready. We want to get the people together. Langston Hughes is going to be the center distribution, the aggregate. All the schools are going to be growing uh, food and Park Ice, Plantation Park Ice is going to coordinate all of it. One day we want to grow Pimlico. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, I haven't heard anything from the folks from Las Vegas, I don't think. Um, is anybody the farmer shipping point? I wanted to make maybe some suggestions too, because um, <coughs> as Pepper as an organization, that's that's a lot of the kind of energy that we're getting is kind of these organizations that normally wouldn't have dabbled in this work, um, working with us, and and so we we kind of look at it two ways: is where can we um, build relationships, um, and where can we have some influence in the places that we're in, because we know. At some point, those doors are closed. So it's good that they're giving money, but where can we leverage um, what we do to build deeper relationships, um, to have more influence down the road? And we do need to kind of operate in those spaces that may be that may have closed doors now. So, so, so what we do as kind of a practice of that. And Em's over here. He says hi, Ryan and, and Khalil. Um, <laughs> what, what what we do um, in those spaces is just open, is just have an open door policy. So we we basically have. A time set every Friday at one o'clock where anybody that wants to come in and talk to us in this space and talk about how we can leverage each other's uh, work um, to build relationships and we, and we really start with the relationship first um, because at the end of the day all marketing is relational so that, that that's one of the ways that we look at it. it's fine you got some dollars to hand out um, and then what we also know too is in terms of impacting our North Star like none of these outside influences are going to shift what we focus on and just as kind of um, um, stewards to the work of community, we hold that most dear over any kind of dollar amount that can come through the door. That's critical. Um, I, I'd like to know more, if I could, about the, the virtual village. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we are uh, currently uh, well, working to become an educational co-op uh, where we collaborate with other um, individual co companies, rather, that are providing virtual learning support to other students, uh, providing family support, um, school staff support. As you know, when we transitioned from in-school learning to virtual learning, it was a, a culture shock to many. And so what we found ourselves doing was supporting so many individuals on an individual level. We said, you know what, well, initially we tried to do learning pods, but then they kind of put some mandates on that as far as uh, here in Maryland uh, saying that, you know, you had to be a certified or uh, I guess a government assigned um, 
institution to be able to do some of these learning pods initially. So we, we st stepped away from that. And then we found ourselves supporting businesses. So we're kind of at this point a, a little bit all over the place, but we're trying to hone in and get back to uh, providing support to students, families, and um, school staff. Okay. And I would imagine given the situation we had recently, again, with COVID-19 and everybody with, with students being at home and, you know, trying to pivot to a different type of learning experience, I would imagine the need for what you all are doing has even grown exponentially. Um, what, what do you, what do you think, what do you think the greatest challenge is right now? I, and you know what, I'm going to be honest that, that we're all over the place and that, uh, like I said, we initially started with schools and then I found that there were so many businesses who were trying small, smaller businesses specifically, um, uh, minority businesses that were having to transition from being brick and mortar to trying to create an online presence. And so we found ourselves supporting businesses as well. So I guess it's just kind of honing in on a specific target market is where I think we've been having the greatest deal of trouble. And, and that's, that's a combination of a couple of things. You know, some of it, as I mentioned before, we were talking about construction, some of that is looking at what is it that you do best and what is what is it you do where there's the greatest profit margin or if you're really focused on need if you're focused on mission you know what are you most committed to i heard farmer chippy talk about the fact that he felt that they were moving away from some of their core values and the you know the intent here was to connect young people with the land and make themselves sustaining and you know create that that kind of a scenario so, you know, maybe there's some issues like that for your company, too, that you need to think about, um, you know, what is it? What is it we really what? First of all, what do we enjoy doing? Because that's important, too. Mm -hmm. If you're doing work that you I heard the construction guy talk about landscaping and that really wasn't their thing. And so if you're doing st if some of those things that you uh, I'm going through this process right now, as I mentioned, with our, our internal thing, we one of the challenges with our website that caused us pause because it was going to be finished a week ago. It would have been finished a week ago. But we listed the services that we offered and capabilities we had, and it was exhaustive. I mean, we really know how to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and my company's Adrian Harper Associates, so there are about a dozen people who work with me on various projects, and I bring in, based on their expertise, you know, uh, um, associate, you know, uh, congruent with whatever the need is of a client. But I started looking at that and I started to say, okay, well, we can do all of this, but do we want to do all of it? What are those things that we do profitably versus the things that I really don't make much money on? Because in cases where I can look at, I can look at, we did 1099s a couple of weeks ago, and I look at all the money went out the door with people who don't work here every day. And I thought about, I said, you know, well, you know, and we, you know, based on how we price things and the margins that we had, some of this stuff we don't want to do anymore. So we kind of really put the brakes on the website for two reasons. One, we had a bunch of photos of people who, you know, it was impressive to see all these people, but some of them, I'm not sure I want to be um, front and center in my operation anymore. I don't want to, uh, uh, I don't want to do landscaping <laughs> so much. So I might want to put the landscapers you know, sit them to the side and we won't focus on bathrooms. I mean, and that's, I mean, that's literally where we're at now too. It's just trying to say, what are the things that I really want to do? What's the business that I enjoy doing? What's most profitable for us? And, and we're going to reduce that list of capabilities and services, even though it's going live Monday, I have capability to, to edit. Um, I'm going to cut that thing down by at least a third, you know, because I don't even want somebody calling me for business, some of these kinds of things that I, I really don't want to do. So I think that's important for you all. If you look at the virtual village, um, you know, what's your vision for that? It sounds like you all need to do some some strategic planning as well. And I don't yeah, know whether sure. is, is Ms. That Apple, a, can I just add, that is that I and I definitely agree. I just have one more quick question because see the problem that I'm finding is that what I enjoy doing is not necessarily as profitable as you know, what's that? Okay, so what I enjoy doing 
doesn't make the money. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. It does. And so, so, so you want to balance that. So, and I have a good friend who has a similar situation in his business. And what I've said to him is, then look at where the highest margin is on the other things that you don't like to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And then focus on some of those because if you're making money and you're making a lot, if you're making, you know, a, getting a good return on it, you'll appreciate the time you spend doing those things. If it's, if that's profitable, even though you don't enjoy them. And then the money that you make from doing that enables you to be able to do the things mm-hmm. that you really enjoy that may not be profitable. So there's a balance there, right? So if you've got a 25% margin, on the stuff or 10% margin, if you even on the stuff that you like to do, but if you can get an 80% margin or 70% margin on the stuff that you don't like, right. Um, that can balance out, but you've got to be very conscious of how you're meeting your time and how you, you know, expending your resources so that you're doing enough of that work that's profitable to offset the, 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 the time that you spend on the things that you enjoy that's not profitable. So it doesn't mean you have to do one or the other. It just means you got to, you know, you got to balance. Uh, Adrian, yes, sir. thank you. Thank you. Um, what is the difference in, in operating a business as opposed to being a part of an economy? Whoa. Um, because we have we have um, businesses that are operating, and one of the mm-hmm. conversations we're going to be having is about the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of uh, 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 of talking about, well, I do this, but I don't want to do this. But how do you develop the, the, the economic ecosystem that you're a part of and that you don't necessarily have to be um, specific about doing everything, but being able to be connected to those that you share the work with? So if yeah. I'm, in, so if I'm yeah. in training in education, that goes across all sectors. And so maybe my sector is this sector, and maybe I have a partner that, or a collaborator that's working in that other sector, which kind of goes back to what you were sharing with Farmer Chippy, that you don't have to, nobody has to be everything. And that you can, in a cooperative, one of the things about being in a cooperative that you are, you can uh, uh, delegate others to be the uh, technician um, within the cooperative without having everybody have to be the technician. True. And, yeah. and that, the infrastructure thing is important, at least, as you said, being part of an ecosystem, because there are people who have, or, or, or you know, members of the organization have specific skills. And I'll give you a good example of that. And, and this again comes back to sort of back to strategic planning again. Mm-hmm. We had a situation where we had a young lady who everybody complained because she talked so much. She wasn't getting work done. She spent all her time having conversations. And then we had someone else who we had answering the phones and they really weren't a people person. They didn't really enjoy that. They were bored to death. Um, You know, people keep calling me. People keep, yeah, they keep calling you. (laughs) Thank God they're calling, right? But what we realized was that the, the talkative person was the person who needed to be answering the phones because she enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she, she loved picking up the phone and was glad to have a conversation with people. And, you know, and, and, it, and it made her day and people enjoyed talking to her because they could sense that she wanted to talk to them. And another person who was really more bookish, we ended up getting her to spend more of her time doing research and, and, and doing work on the computer because she liked that kind of focus and, really liked being on her own and doing things. So I think that ecosystem you're talking about is important to create that and to see where the strengths are um, because sometimes people are typically in the wrong place. Um, there are a lot of people who are supervising who have no business supervising, right? Um, you know, they say, they say um, he was a good worker, so we made him a supervisor. That mm. doesn't necessarily, you know, he or she might have done a better job out in the field. If you've got somebody who likes getting their hands dirty and, and they're out there farming, you know, let them do that. Don't force them into the office to do paperwork. Mm-hmm. Vice versa, if you've got somebody who is good at paperwork and does not really want to get their nails dirty, 
or doesn't want to get their tennis shoes, you know, like likes to wear them fresh, the fresh, uh, you know, uh, you know, fresh Jordans and doesn't want to really, you know, doesn't want to put on work boots. Find a, if they're going to stay in the organization, place them in a place where they can mm. be comfortable, where they can be the most productive. Well, and yeah. and so sometimes it takes that. So and and the point is that people coming into that, you know, back to that point, Father Chippy, uh, Brother Chippy, people coming in don't, you know, I signed up for this, but then I didn't really know what it was until I got in it, right? And now that I'm in it and I see it, and yeah, I committed to this, but mm, this ain't really what I thought, you know. So sometimes you got to give people an opportunity to do that. They not to say that they're not committed to the effort, but they might not be committed to the task. Mm, right? And so, you know, the challenge is to see who's, you know, who's really committed to the task, who enjoys the task, and how do you find ways for them to to do the most of that? Um, like they say, you could probably teach a dog to climb a, climb a tree, but you're better off getting a squirrel to do it. I think I think one too, just to add to that too, in, in, in the way that we look at our work here at Kepler is really about human development. And so um, we, we, we tend to look at it more from a social aspect of less about outcomes and more about the development and the process of the, of the person. And so what that allows you to do is kind of shape the work around where the individual is at um, and, and kind of grow the organization and the ecosystem with that person's personal development as well. So we say self-mastery through community empowerment. And so, again, that's kind of one of the guiding lights in terms of how we just even organize our organization and what missing pieces do we look for, in, you know, in the larger ecosystem. Um, and, and that and that translates into various social enterprises too. So, kind of so, so the development guide a lot of a lot of where we find opportunity. I dig it. I, I really dig the model. I understand it. However, the reality is this: farming in the city is brand new to all of the people, ninety-five percent of them. So, when they're coming on board, the person who's onboarding them or the group who's onboarding them must be trained to identify the strengths in them. So that piece requires financing, a whole development of your staff. This is part of it right here, what we're doing. But this piece is not being funded by the big corporations. We have to find our own money through our sales and services in order to do this. And I think as a group or a co-op, we really need to concentrate on this. Yeah, are you 501c3? Are you are you a registered nonprofit? Because there's a lot of grant money out there. Yes, man. Yes, for sure. I can be the, the I can be the source of pulling the money. I've got mm -hmm. all the documents in line to get their money at a big level, and we <laughs> should all get in line. And so, if we're stronger that way, but the, mm -hmm. the thing is, we pull all the money in. Let's put a structure in that works. Let's look back at the ancestors, see what they did, see what failed, what worked. Take out the policies and add high-speed internet, cable TV, and cell phone to the new mix. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. And we need to really put a team together, concentrate on that. There are some young college-based girls and boys out there who we can put on that mission. But we must find a structure that's going to onboard people and make them, you know, bring them to a better place. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good part. And as part of our ecosystem is just engaging with all the universities and internships um, in the organization. I mean, that that's a good point. And I, and I feel like you're headed in the right direction from the way you even address and how you're going to tackle some of the issues. So here's the thing. We, we, we were fortunate enough that we have the number one medical research in um, university in the world, Johns Hopkins. So they came to us about eight weeks ago asking to do a, a study. Now, we never mess with Johns Hopkins because Johns Hopkins has an attitude that they're Johns Hopkins and they want to do this and we all allow them because they'll give us $10,000. I am not having that. So I said to them, I understand what you want to study. What you're studying does not improve us. Go back and find a health disparity study that's going to improve our living. So they go back, they come back. It took six weeks of beating them into shape. And this is the kind of stance that I'm talking about. Beat them in the shape so they know what we want, not what they want, to fit into their portfolio, to get more funding, to give us 10%, and we spend all our time reporting to them. That's not the way. I managed to get a $10,000 starter grant. 3,500 of it is allocated to my young student who's at 
Howard University bio, um, she's a biology major. She gets that money. She follows their PI. So she's my PI. And then she understands the strategy and technique of collecting the data, playing with the data, realizing the assessments and evaluation. So we know how to do it. We need to find out how they're doing it so we know how to do it, so we can have our people do it. Our children can grow from pharma to scientists right mm -hmm. in the same ecosystem. So yeah. we need to figure that out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly agree with you of, of, of Pharma Chippy. And I want to go back uh, to what Marcus Garvey said back in the 20s and 30s about building institutions. We have to do institutional building in our communities. We have to really focus on institutional building in our communities. Right, you know, right. I've I've been pondering this question, and and Adrian, I, Adriana and I have been in discussions over the last couple of weeks with even this cooperative academy. What goes on after you leave these twelve weeks? How are we going to really be able to support your your cooperatives beyond just this twelve week introduction? So we're now looking at a cooperative development center that can provide the wraparound assistance for you to, to scale your cooperatives. And so yes, Farmer Chippy takes into account bringing a capital partner into it that can provide financing, but also too, knowing that as a growing business and, and thank you, Adrian, in terms of telling Khalil that it's not uh, a fledging, but it is an emerging business which means that you're in a growth path. And so all of you are in a growth path. So for us, it's to say, how can we sustain your growth? Because you're gonna to continue to go through phases of evolution as a business, based on some of the environmental changes that we know that happens in the business environment. And so we wanna be able to, at the end of this, this uh, doing this 12 week period, have solidified that question about when, when you ask us the question, well, Ron, what's after this? We can say here, this is something now that we've been developing, working on, that will help to scale and your multiplier in terms of a, a business uh, uh, as a cooperative business. So we can I can, can I piggyback on that, please? Uh, uh, I just want to piggyback on that, brother Ron, just to to kind of emphasize and you know kind of what Damon's been talking about the importance of institution building. And Farmer Chippy had put in the uh, chat. And had uh, alluded to the new way, you know, pre, you know, uh, post COVID and all that. But really, you know, much bigger than that for disenfranchised people and populations. We've been looking at ways and means to operate, you know, in a new way for quite some time, long before this. And so, as we are, and it is important that we understand and have a fundamental understanding of those past systems. What institution does, real institution, is allow you to create a new rubric and a new metric. So therefore, even so. And as I hear, we're trying to quantify and be able to, you know, uh, uh, garner resources and dollars and all that. But what's really important is that, and this is the part that's difficult for business and everything in that gap. As you are, if you really become focused and intentional about that development, that human development that Pharma Chippy is about, that onboarding, which speaks to the education of people understanding, you know, um, 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 internally, you know, that process. There will be a lag there between what you're able to garner in terms of those old resources, money, nickels and dimes, and your investment will become in that development process. Now, what we have to do is create institution first so that it can garner that weight while we push through. We, you know, I, I, you know, I just have to say we've been able to do that and grow our leadership. And now that's what's important about that is that you have to, you know, our, our, our director always talks about being lean. You know, in your process, it's, you know, this is a lean process. There are things that you prioritize and that you, you know, value. But in our phase and a new way, I just have to emphasize that relationship and the development of humans and your journey is will become the most paramount as we move forward, despite what everybody else is telling us. And if we do that on a cellular level where we're all valuing that process, then we, again, will inherently create our own rubric and metric and move away from needing their validation and, you know, all those other uh, uh, dollars and those things that they value so much, uh, you know, but in this moment, I, I don't negate the, the need for those resources, but let's continue to focus on the new way and trying to uh, establish ourselves so we can do that. But yeah, I, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, yeah, thank thank you for that. Um, uh, no no black man and, and no black woman has been able to achieve what Marcus Garvey achieved in the 1930s in terms of organizing 
over five million people. Agreed. Nobody has been able to do that. To do that, and he did it to through using culture. He did through politics, um, and so um, and he was able to get people, as as Adrian has said earlier, about getting them engaged and and in, in areas where they had interests. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, to 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 be involved in, and so I. I I know that we're all in in, in a changing, ever changing environment, and so so it's a matter of how we have some some basic principles, and that's was the first uh, session, and, and we're still going to go back to that first session about principles, because I'm a I'm a firm believer in principles. That if we have principles around who we are, how we define ourselves, right, that guides all of our work. From Chippy is talking about principle. He said, "No, I don't want your money. You know, I want your intellect. <laughs> That's my principle. And now mm -hmm. use your intellect to to make money. But I want to learn the process. And so that was a principle that he's, you know, he's evoked. And I'm quite sure all of you have principles involved in the work that you're doing. And and so these are the things that we have to share with community and other partners. You know." that we are developing principle-based businesses mm -hmm. that, that are guided by principles, that are built on principles. And that's why I shared the seven principles of Nuga Saba. Um, there was a question in the box, I recall someone said, well, what, how do you know which one to use? I think for me today, I know that culturally and spiritually, my principles are much more aligned with an Afrocentric perspective about how to do things. And that doesn't mean that I dismiss some of the, the other uh, uh, practices or in, don't incorporate them in the work. Because I said there's learned lessons to be learned in all this, all of this, the processes. But I think in terms of where I see how to connect these young folks, they're, they're looking differently now. I was with some folks last night and um, um, most of them would have been my, would have been my great grandkids. <laughs> but I loved hearing the conversations and what interests them. And how they want to get engaged, uh, which is a much more different conversation than, than my generation had. So I think there's a lot to be learned, um, but we got to be open and receptive to to that whole process. And yeah. I, I think one of the things too, and, and that's why, I, like, what I what I hear you, I mean, kind of addressing Farmer Chippy and the way that you're moving through the work and how you build your organization is a lot of that institution building based on principle, and so. It's just, you know, it's just growing pains. I mean, we're talking about 400 years and and farther than that in terms of capitalism and how do you reshape that to build something new? So the way you're moving about it and tackling it is one thing. I know one thing that gives us a little bit more opportunity in our space is it's not so much always about the vehicle in which you're doing the work because the vehicle may have some constraints on what part of human development you have time to even do or even finance. And so you start to see how does it branch into both the development how does your work, how does our work both branch into the development of the individual in the work and the development of community as one of those guiding principles to how we even figure out where we go in terms of a vertical. So you may see us doing things from climate justice to, to construction co-ops to things, but it's really mm -hmm. about individual development and community ve development based on those principles and and and, and building an organization, an uh, institution. Mm -hmm. I, I am so excited about this conversation. Thank you so much. You guys made my entire week with this conversation. I'm so happy that we can talk about this openly because yeah. this is a conversation that must be had and this is the moment. If we get it together by the summer and we're able to grow 250,000 pounds of food in Park Heights and get all our 15 organizations in alignment with the IRS and in compliance and all that, I think we're looking at 2022 strong, and that's when the money starts running. So mm -hmm. we need to really think about how we're going to, you know, line ourselves up and onboard others so they can get ready too. So we can get all this money in our community and then pick a fight <laughs> <laughs> and do our own thing. <laughs> Bob Chip is a fighter. <laughs> I, I, I do want to just uh, do a check in. Uh, normally we take a break, um, give folks a chance to do 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 stretch their legs, refresh themselves, take care of their bodily needs. Uh, but Adrian, and I know that you didn't um, uh, plan to be in this window with us this long. So 
So I do want to ask um, if there's anything you want to close out with, because I do want to just be mindful of your time um, before we leave. I know Adriana has put your contact information in the in the chat box. And additionally, um, your information is in the directory of all the speakers as well. Right. So they do have access and and you and you have, have um anointed that by saying that they can reach out to you as they, sure. as they choose to well, thank I'm, you. I'm I'm really encouraged by what I've heard as well as uh, to learn about these the various uh, enterprises. Now I will say I, I think I made reference in Nevada, um, the Black Wall Street project. I'd like to know more about there. Derwin, if you have an opportunity to either send me something or we can connect at another point. So I could know more about that, but um, but I'm I'm really uh, encouraged by what you all are doing, Ron. As you know, you and I have talked a lot about my experience with cooperatives, with housing cooperatives, mm -hmm. and I've been involved in some other cooperatives that we haven't talked about. But um, it, it's really exciting to know that there is a way to develop some collective economics, and your notion about creating a, a uh, an ecosystem is critical because we've seen the systems that we have in place right now in our economy and they don't work. They especially don't work for brown and black people. So I think we have to go back to our roots and you know we can talk about again corporate development, business development. There are a lot of principles, there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot there's a lot of science that that, that is proven to be uh, pretty effective. But I think innately it's about relationships as we've talked about before. The commitment to people to make to make to one another, um, because we, you know, the other type of uh, interaction, legal agreements, contracts, and the like, those things can be subverted. You know, they're loopholes. We've seen how people can get in and out of. And whenever I talk about a, a, a contract with someone, uh, an agreement, I mean, I do them because it's necessary. But you know, the, the agreements only is only worth as much as the the word of the person who signs it. That's right. That's so right. if people who, you know, if you're in contract with people and they don't have good intentions, um, then it doesn't matter what the paper says, you know, take me to court, you know, or let's go to court. But um, I think ultimately the human interaction, one knows what the other has contributed, what can they continue to contribute. And as you all talked about, um, Brother uh, Damon has talked about the um, human development the in the development of human capital it's critical because uh, um, none of us will ever do as well as the least of us are able to do you know and as long as we create conditions that support the notion that one has to take something that they have nothing of value to bring to the marketplace that they can barter or can um, can sell and have have any way to support themselves and we will always have crime and murder and drug dealing and the other kinds of things that we see in our communities uh, because the people who are engaged in those enterprises have been told and been have been convinced by others that they have nothing of value um, that people want. And so they're disenfranchised and they find their own way to support themselves or to, to disrupt an economy that they can't participate in. So I'm open. I'm I'm always looking for any way I can support your your efforts, um, Ron, and any of those people who are on the line today. Um, again, feel free to reach out, and uh, we can communicate via email, text. I even pick up the phone. So. <laughs> okay. so this is Derwin here in in Las Vegas. How are you? Yes, uh, I'm fine. I just want to say I appreciate uh, all of your uh, efforts today, um, and I'm enjoying the conversation. I'm listening to it, uh, and you know, when you read the book Paranomics, you're going to find out that a lot of what you're discussing is already addressed in that. Uh, it goes by level to level. It goes from uh, building uh, ethnos aggregation, which brings culture together. That's the glue that brings us together, first of all, because our problem is a, as a people, is a mental problem. It's not a, you know, all the resources are there for money, capital today. There's no laws in, in, out there to keep us from coming together and doing business. So why are we last economically? We're last economically because mentally we don't have what it takes to come together collectively on a national scale to bring about the change that we're looking for. We, we're spending a lot of money uh, with, with every other ethnicity, 
uh, but we have the power within our own hands to create whatever we want, whatever kind of economy, whatever kind of a future we want in America, we have the power to do it. Um, that's one of the things Black Wall Street's about. And I'm on here to learn about using cooperative development uh, as an economic development tool, because I truly believe that that is the key to narrowing the wealth gap in the African American community. It addresses a lot of the lack of trust issues that we have, the lack of capital issues that we have. It brings us together collectively and it addresses the community issue because we can't recycle dollars until we rebuild and reclaim our community. So, you know, and in, in Powernomics, it talks about building vertically integrated businesses across all sectors of businesses. We should be in research development. We should be in marketing distribution. We should control all that. From the cradle to the grave in a lot of economies that we have, like in hair care products, black hair care products, we did back in the day but now we've given that all up to the Asian community. So the point of the matter is, I was just, I didn't want to go way off on a tangent, but I just wanted to say that if you read the book Paranormal, you're going to see that a lot of that, it starts from the business aspect, the uh, community aspect it addresses, ethos aggregation, the need for us to come together as a culture uh, and, uh, you know, a common denominator. It addresses how we can do that. And then it takes us on from that to business, then to political, controlling our uh, uh, political uh, standing here in America. And it's just a lot of good information. So I would recommend that book because I've been hearing the conversation and everything you guys are talking about, it falls right into Paranomics. And, uh, and Black Wall Street follows Paranomics. As a, that's our New Testament. You well, know, just, and, uh, just, one, one quick uh, thing. One, one quick thing. Um, you got to remember, the audience we're talking about, they don't read, bro. So we have to try to digitize this in small 30 second clips and just push it in their face. This is a this is a digital crew. They do high speed internet, cable TV, and cell phone. When you talk to them on a now, I communicate on many different platforms, and I'm sure you do too, because we were educated uh, in a Babylonian system using the same tools, right? So now we're here. There are different tools out there. These kids are building games at nine years old. That is the interest. So if you put the powernomics into a game, then we're talking something. There are ways to do this, but we cannot use the old technique about go pick up a book, go read. That ain't working, brethren. What's working is you read to them or you make it a multimedia thing. You bring them to your venue and you do a 30 second something and put it in their face because their attention span is three minutes. Yeah, I just joined a, uh, an organization, a national effort uh, called the Black Achievement Fund. And you all mentioned earlier, um, uh, Ron mentioned Garvey. This group has got a mission to get 5 million people to contribute on a uh, weekly or monthly basis uh, towards some co cooperative economic goals. I'll forward that to you all. I can't say I'm promoting it yet because I just joined and I'm just trying to learn. And to your point, Farmer Chippy, um, their com mode of communication is not as uh, not as progressive as I believe it could be to be more effective. So before I offer them any advice, I'm trying to learn more about what they're doing. I've already subscribed to it and began contributing money to it. One of the people on my staff is an ambassador for that organization here in Maryland, and she's been bringing all of us on board. We've all just agreed to chip in basically because we of our faith in her. But um, we're learning more about it. And as, uh, if I know more, I'll share that with you and Ron and others. And uh, it may be something you may want to consider taking a look at, but it is, uh, you mentioned, uh, Derwin mentioned those verticals. It is focused on developing those verticals across the country. And I guess the notion is, I forget the dollar amount that their goal is around, but it's sort of the Garvey model. If you if you get 5 million people contributing, I think it's $10 a week or something like that. Uh, it's a phenomenal amount of money that would enable um, the development of, a, of an infrastructure and a lot of support to, to businesses, support to enterprises and cooperative economics. But again, I'm not, I'm only, at this point, I'm only talking about it because I buy in to the notion. I don't really know enough about it to strongly endorse it yet. Uh, Farmer Chip, to your point, um, one of the things, I mean, you, you're definitely spot on, like, ain't about to pick up no book. Um, <laughs> Um, in, in some cases, how we look at it from an intergenerational approach, 
So we may have 12 year olds in the team with 77 year olds helping to shape and develop what that particular program looks like. And you get so many insights um, and, and you just learn a lot from that by, by having an intergenerational approach. And that is one of the that is one of the key principles. So like my, my, my 12 year old daughter's right here right now, you know, in, in the garden. And so that 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 is just the way of living that that brings that that brings into fruition everybody if you if you if you keep that intergenerational approach first and foremost. So, 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 so that's true. That's true. But let me give you a practical experience of what is actually happening. This happened a couple of days ago. So a prominent lady who's well respected in my community came out and she decided she was gonna do kites. She was gonna build kites for for Easter. Right, so she came out to build kites. Her suggestions while she were there was, I've got to teach the kids how to write a proper letter with pen and paper. I said to her, listen, miss, I don't think that's a good idea. Maybe you teach them to form a letter using uh, Microsoft Word or something, you know, something like that, or make sure everybody has an email address, et cetera, et cetera, and decide. So she didn't want to get involved in that. Anyway, she came to do the kites, the, uh, and everybody got around, and then the kids started to disappear one at a time because it was not interested. They were not interested. As important as the kites were to her, they she, the children had no interest in it, right? So she decided to do a postcard. All right, that's cool. They got around again. She decided to do a postcard for a political figure. They all left again. Do you see what I'm saying? So we have to stop. Stop right here. Stop and listen. Let's listen for the next year. Get ourselves together, close ranks, and listen. Because we're coming up with all these ideas of how we're gonna attract and and we have six foot, we have six foot picnic tables. We have older folks that come. Miss Marilyn Butler can tell you about this. She's our box lady as well. We give out food every Thursday, 380 boxes of food. These children come by, they're there all the time. It was spring break last week, so there's tons of them running all over the place doing them. At our farm, the adults have no say. If you're 15 and over, you do not have a say. 15 and under, I can be having a conversation with Adrian. I will stop the conversation right now and turn to the 15-year-old or the 14-year-old if they come to me. And Miss Marilyn can, can vouch for this. What we need to do as adults who are educated in the Babylonian system, we know all aspects of the Babylonian system. Let's infiltrate it. Let's take what we have, build our people, spend the next year listening, and listen to what our black children want. The money that's coming is for the people who were left out. Those are the people who were left out. The corner boys, the single mother. Let's listen to them before we make any structure here. Let's close ranks and learn the Babylonian system enough where we are in compliance with the IRS. In the past, that is how they destroyed black men. So let's pay attention here. All these ideas can be real as long as we structure up. I, Adrian, you're the man. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you, Ron, for bringing him. And thanks for all the input. This looks like the train is moving. I like it. <laughs> well, I'm glad to have joined you all. And, and I appreciate the, um, uh, the the opportunity to connect with you directly. Because, uh, again, I've, you know, we've I've heard, heard, heard so much about what you all are doing and want to support that. Ron and Adriana, I appreciate you all inviting me, and um, and I guess I'm scheduled for one of these again and um, somewhere down there. I saw the schedule, so I never know. <laughs> Without looking at my phone, I never know where I'm supposed to be, but I am <clears throat> I am headed to another meeting. So thank you again so much, everybody. I appreciate the input and uh, uh, how you've inspired me and hope to um, continue to work with you all in some way or another. All right. Stay, Adrian, stay healthy, brother. Stay healthy. Well, indeed. Yeah. Thank, off. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harpool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All righty. Um, well, folks, uh, it's about 1215. And so we haven't taken our normal break today. So we're going to we're going to uh, uh, um, commence earlier today. Um, but we do want to give some reminders uh, to you in, in, in the group. I, I have to really uh, home in on 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 the importance of this convening and having etiquette from all of us around how we show up. Um, um, 
I, I, I want to just remind us that there's a way when we talk about principle, there's a principle way that we all need to show up each and every Saturday in this space. And so um, share that with your team members, have your, your, your folks talk about that. I don't want to be the, the gentleman who, who, who um, discharges you from this academy, but believe me, I will have no hesitancy about doing it when you start showing up incorrectly. So, so let's be, let me just be clear on, on where I stand in terms of what I'm expecting out of you. Um, uh, Adrian and all these folks uh, come here giving their time, and I'm certainly glad to know that you are finding some, some worth in what they're sharing with you. Um, so go back and talk about the etiquette um, because that's important for us as, as we bring our partners uh, into this space. Um, going forward, uh, I do want you to, to connect with, with um, Adriana in terms of scheduling a time where I can sit down and talk with you individually on your teams because I need I still want to get a further understanding of where you're going and what your needs are and how can we can support you. And if we can't support you, how other partners in the ecosystem can support the work that you're doing. So, um, so let's get those 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 opportunities um, scheduled. Um, it's been a lot of discussion around skill development, knowledge uh, acquisition, and so this conference is coming up. We're willing to to put some money on the table so that you can have some representation there. So, uh, go back and take a look at it. See if, if there's some interest on your part to attend some of those sessions, and we'll make the you know we'll make the investment on our behalf to you to get you into that that, that conference. But the window is closing, folks. The window is closing, um, particularly for the introductory fee that they're offering of uh, fifty fifty nine forty nine dollars and the two I think two dollars whatever it is. But but nevertheless, we're we're willing to put that money up on the table for you. Um, if there's some suggestions that you have going forward in terms of specifically some things that you um, would like to us to explore, um, you know, let Adriana know, um, uh, and she'll, you know, and I, and I will talk about it. We got some, we just um, secured some new speakers coming in, talk about governance and taxation and about taxes, because there again, while, we're doing this work. We got to understand that there's, it's still a business and a business conversation that we need. We need to have around businesses. Uh, Adriana, if anything I'm, I'm missing um, thus far? Uh, no, so far so good. I would just add a couple of details. So I just put the link for the conference. If everyone wants to take another look, it's in your inboxes. Um, so just please reach out to me if you are interested. And then uh, Ron mentioned the one-on-one -on -one team with him meetings. And so please, please do fill out those doodle polls. Um, I would just add for clarification. So most of the time, the dates that we offer are Mondays, uh, Thursdays, and Saturdays before the session. So if you're uncomfortable with the doodle poll, but you know personally what your schedule is, you can just reach out to me. You can put, call me on my phone. You can email me anything. Um, I'm here to help you schedule this meeting. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of feedback, we welcome your feedback. And I will know uh, every time that we meet after the end of the meeting, there's a post session survey. And so that gets sent to your email at 1 p.m. after every meeting. So we do read those. Please provide your feedback and we'll make sure to incorporate it. Um, and you can also reach out to me personally if there's other things you'd like to, to mention. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, I, and I just have to always just recognize Adriana and what she does and what she's been doing. Um, she's finishing up her her degree at Rutgers University, and she came to the space early February, and um, and every you know morning we come on the, together, her and I, at nine in the morning, just to sort of make sure that we're in a space of understanding what we're trying to present to you, and that we're doing what we're doing in the correct way. And so we spend a lot of time. Um, she's going to be transitioning um, in May um, um, to her her next uh, endeavors in life. And so, um, so I'm, I certainly want to be able to support that. And so, um, so she, and she's put a lot of work in, um, unbelievable work over the last understanding, um, this work around cooperatives and what it means to be, um, frankly, in 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 a space of of of, of working with people of color, 
And so um, she's been open and receptive. She's brought her own ideas and thoughts into the space, not trying to 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 um, lead them thoughts. So I'm really happy and going to miss her when she uh, makes that transition. But until that time comes, I'm going to continue to look forward to working with her and having her work with us. Um, so we're going to let you go, uh, folks. Um, um, it's Saturday. Um, Farmer Chippy, get to that farm. Get them. Get, 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 get those, yeah, I, and I think I'll be over there Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Come on through, bro. Come on through. I'll be through on Thursday. Believe me, I'll be stopping through on Thursday. Go uh, through, man. Come and see the vibe, yo. Again, uh, folks, take him. You don't need the, the wait to Saturday to call me. Uh, Darwin uh, communicates with me on a, on a regular basis, and I, I encourage you all to. So let's bounce ideas. This is how we grow. Um, bounce ideas and thoughts off each other. So uh, as you exit out, have a wonderful Saturday. We look forward to seeing you um, uh, next Saturday. Um, who's on the calendar? I think we have um, our business planner on the calendar for next week. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recall my memory. But um, anyway, I'll look forward to seeing you next Saturday and continue to have a blessed day. And uh, I appreciate, appreciate you all, what you bring to the space. All right? All right. Thank you. We appreciate you as well, Rob, and, and your. Dice, I'm going to teach you.